Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, uh, bringing you the seventh episode of Pat Novak for Hire that we've got uh, from the 1949 season. Um, th this episode uh, focuses on uh, a blackmail plot. There's a couple of really interesting things that happen. Uh, plus, if you like, um, if you like the uh, uh, Pat Novak speak, this has got to to be just some of the best insults. Uh, I'm telling you, you're going to really enjoy this particular episode. Uh, before we get started, I, I do want to let you know briefly about Netflix. Netflix is great uh, because it allows you to be able to choose what you want to watch. Uh, so many times you go to a video store, go to one of those uh, machines, and all you got in there, you got the latest re uh, releases. Um, with Netflix, what makes it so great is that you can choose the films you like, and then Netflix will make suggestions right out of the blue, uh, seemingly, but based on your past choices and the things you said, no, nah, I'm really not going to enjoy that. Um, Netflix is available for a two-week free trial, and we encourage you to try it out. Go to netflix.greatdetectives.net or go to greatdetectives.net and just click on the Netflix banner to, to learn more. And if you've got an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3, you are able to stream uh, videos directly to your television now. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into this episode uh, uh, Pat Novak for Hire, Joe Candano. Pat Novak for Hire. sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. It's an easy way to put it, because if you're going to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to do everything but run for office. I rent boats and kick around a few scruples if the price is right. It's a living, and if anything goes wrong, you can always get your mother a visitor's pass. If you do get in trouble, you go first class all the way. I found that out when I first met Doreen Wilde. It was almost dark, and I was sitting in the office with the door open when she first showed up. Showed up's the right word. The wind was blowing outside and pushed her dress tightly against her legs as she walked in. She was young. From what I could see, she made Cleopatra look like Apple Mary. She had a voice like a bowl of warm stew. Hello. Are you Mr. Novak? That's my story. I'm Doreen Wilde. Mind if I sit down? On your desk here? You'll block the view. You'll get used to the new one. There. Now lean back and let me look at you. Hmm. I want to hire you, Mr. Novak. After the look or before? You've got a power complex, darling. You know a man named Joe Condono? Well, he's a gambler out on Geary Street, friend of yours. I don't dislike him that much. We have business connections. That's why I want to hire you, to give him some money tonight. A needy case or a bad debt? A bad debt. Condano has an IOU from my brother for $10,000. You can go from there. Not if I'm supposed to say it was a fixed game. Condano's been around a long time. Yes. That's right. There are only two kinds of gamblers in this town, honest ones and dead ones. So if your brother owes ten grand, he better pay. That's why I'm hiring you. Just pay off Condano and make sure you get the pictures. Pictures of the Grand Canyon, huh? We'll talk about my past some other time. Well, for the moment, we'll just say you're photogenic. That's right. 
Your brother can't get the ten grand, so Condano's shaking you down. Yes. Yeah. I'll bet you make a nice rattle. How did Condano get the pictures? My brother gave them to him. You got a charming brother. You see only his better side. Will you do the job for a hundred dollars? How long is it going to take? Two hours, maybe. You'll have to meet with my brother. To meet with your brother, a hundred bucks is coolie wages. He'll give you the information, then you can see Condano. Where do I meet your brother? Room 729, the Dixie Hotel. He'll be there about 8.30. That packing crate down on Powell Street? Your brother's a cutie. I know why knows it wouldn't go in there. We'll meet you there at 8.30. Oh? You gonna be there? Yeah. Do you mind? I can stand it. Carry a spare battery for that gleam in your eye? Your hundred bucks covers that, too. See you at 8.30. She smiled at me, and I felt like a guy that just found an oil well in the basement. Well, there were a lot of things about the deal I didn't like, but she kind of made you forget. I kept remembering her as she walked out of there with a slow, easy gait. She had knee action that'd make a Nash jealous. Well, I hit the Dixie Hotel about 8.25. It was the kind of a hotel that has a 4 a.m. checkout rule. There were two or three guys sitting around reading tip sheets, and over in the corner, a couple of well-upholstered gals were talking about recipes, I guess. The desk clerk was the worst of the lot. He looked like a guy that might have been expelled from Alcatraz. Nobody looked up as I walked through. When I got to 7.29, I knocked... There was no answer, so I opened the door and walked in. There was a bed lamp on and a lot of smoke in the room. Through the smoke, I could pick out the committee. They were crazy about me. Come on in. Looking for someone? Yeah, yeah, but she's got a better figure than you. Close the door. No, she's not here. I'll just run along. Close the door, mister. You need the ventilation. I said close the door. Now sit down. Sit down on the bed there. You're a tough host. So I'm broken hearted. Just be a good boy now and give it to me, huh? You got the wrong guy. You'd give it to me fast, mister. I don't know what you're talking about. I came up here to meet somebody. Already met him. I've run across better people in sewers. Now, look, meathead, I'm only going to say this once more, so make a copy. You got the wrong guy. You think I got something? I haven't got it. No. No, so you and your playmates swing out of here in your tails. I never saw you until three minutes ago, and I'm tired of the friendship already. All right. Eddie. Yeah? Go through this guy's coat. Yeah, sure. Now, wash your hands, Junior, and then put them in your own pockets. Oh. Uh, you, uh, you got a favorite profile, fella? Hmm? Because I'm going to put this gun on one side. Take your choice. <laughs> Grab him, hold him up. <laughs> All right, Eddie. Now you don't have to wash your hands. <laughs> Woke up with a head the size of Rhode Island. I rolled over and tried to get up, but I was about as strong as a moth in a wind tunnel. The room was dark, and I couldn't see very well. It was a stale, musty odor. Could have been a marathon dancer's dressing room, with a little fixing up, the sort of place you wouldn't be found dead in. There was a guy lying next to me who didn't feel that way about it. One look at the guy, and I could see he was dead from the crew cut down. Somebody wrapped a towel around his throat and forgot to say when. I should have got out of there right then, but I used my brain like a bottle of medicine, a small dose every three hours. I stood there, looking down at him, and felt like a guy that's just rolled a seven the second time out. A small chunk of light squeezed through the door, and I could see particles of dust settling on his face. He was lying there, straight and white-faced, with a little bit of scowl as if he didn't like the idea. I went through his wallet and found a few bucks and some identification. Enough to prove he was Frank Wilde, Doreen's brother. Oh, it looked nice and clear. They'd done everything but pin the IOU on his shirt. Well, I couldn't wait around because when Homicide got there, I was going to be as popular as a can of salmon on Friday. Homicide meant Inspector Hellman, a guy that couldn't even make the vice squad. We were as close as a piccolo and a bass trombone. I got to thinking about him and decided to get out of there. It was a good idea five minutes ago. Hello, 
Novak. Oh, Hellman. Small wake, huh? Just a few close friends. You always drop by room 729 this time of night? I got a bad memory for faces. Who's your friend? His name's Frank Wilde. That's one answer. I was supposed to meet him here at 830. That's another. You got a third? Hmm? Who killed him? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe three or four people. Maybe a pack of lugs from Joe Condano's. Yeah? I think you're modest, Novak. I think maybe you killed him. Oh, yeah, sure. I wrapped the towel around his neck, beat myself to death with a pistol, and jumped into the same grave. Maybe. Oh, stop it, Hellman. That isn't smart. That still leaves you in the running. I came up here to make a hundred bucks. That's all I know about it. Check down at the desk. They'll tell you. I checked on the way up. The desk clerk says room 729 is in your name. Get your dough back, Hellman. You've been hijacked. Yeah? Look up a gal named Doreen Wilde. Who's she? The stiff sister. He got in a jam with Joe Condano and bailed himself out with some pictures. Oh. What kind of pictures? You just look her up and find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. I got a bird in the hand. And call on Joe Condano. His gunsel's held a convention here tonight. That's too much legwork. You're handy, Novak. I can't afford a bum rap, Hellman. Get yourself another boy. You get me one. It's your hotel room. There's a dead guy in it, and you got a bad record. I can make that add up for the DA. You can't add a pair of zeros without crib notes, Hellman. I can try hard, and I'll be all through in 24 hours. That's how long you got, Novak. You got one day, and you're not going to be lonesome. Because I'm going to put a tail on you the whole time. Well, that'll be fun. I'm going to know where you are every minute. Stop posing, will you? You couldn't follow an elephant across a basketball court. Just stay handy, Novak. I'll be ready. I'm going to fingerprint this room and run that towel through a test. And then I'll be ready. Yeah, you better watch out for that towel. Huh? Remember, when it comes to towels, Hellman, you have to start from scratch. <laughs> Hellman was smiling like an Academy Award winner. I didn't blame him, because from my side of the road, things looked rough. From here in, he could play a pat hand and come out all right. There were only two other people, Joe Condano and that girl. I was real worried, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He was all right for a guy who tries to drink all the whiskey in the world every night, only some night he's going to make it. I finally found him at the Bellevue Hotel, holed up in the hunt room. He was getting the most he could out of a bottle, old whiskey and young ideas. It was 10 o'clock, and he was carrying a bigger load than the Berlin airlift. Oh, ho! A drink for Mr. Novak, and one for me. I'll have to catch up. Skip me. You busy, Jocko? I'm deep in the labor of love. What happened to your face? I got a better offer. I'm in a jam, Jocko. You gotta help me. You're always in a jam. You're the eternal patsy. Also, you're my solitary reason for going on. Forget it, Jocko. Well, you're the last project Providence has allowed me. An hors d'oeuvre that fate has thrown me to nibble on. I'm your conscience, you know. Yeah, all right, all right. You have no conscience of your own. Oh, you have fleeting moments of fright which you confuse as moral sense, but... No conscience. All right, let's get off the platform, shall we? I need help quick. Uh, what kind of jam? A big one? Yeah. I woke up about an hour ago holding hands with a dead man. Where? Room 729 at the Dixie Hotel. I hope you changed rooms. Hellman walked in and found me praying for the dead. He's got an idea I did it. A shrewd policeman. That was the second feature. We opened with a pistol whipping by Joe Condano's gunsels. Oh, you got to help me. Would uh, a drink help? Hellman's got a guy tailing me. I got to go slow, Jocko. I want you to hit Condano's place and pick up every scrap of dope, will you? Oh, I'd look out of place in a gambling joint. There's a bar. Tour the joint and find out when the boys got back, huh? Where do you plan to be? Uh, hiding under a rose bush? I'm going up to see a girl. She's the dead guy's sister. Are you going up to extend sympathy? Uh, she's mixed up, too. Condano's holding some blackmail pictures. Hmm. Let's reverse the assignment. Now, look, you see Condano, I'll tag by Doreen Wilde's place. Huh? She must be Harry Wilde's daughter. Who's he? The money crowd, to use a low term. What's he like? A retired octopus. After he got sick of chasing cigarette girls, he settled down to be a social worker. Yeah? Now he's like all social workers. A guy who's embarrassed because he wasn't born poor. And for years, he's been annoying the poor by trying to help them. Hit Condano's place. Now, if you hit anything good, phone me at her apartment. And keep out of trouble. I'd say the same to you if it weren't futile. Good night, lover. When I walked out, Geary Street was cold and deserted. 
the fog had moved in and staked out a claim all the way down to Market Street. There were two Marines across the street arguing, so I didn't hear it at first. When I got out of range, I began to hear the footsteps behind me. I stopped once and the footsteps broke off. I walked on a few yards and the footsteps were right behind me. They had a familiar ring and I was sure it was either Hellman or a water buffalo. When I stopped and waited, Hellman walked up. You're out late, Novak. What happened to that tail? He asked for more dough. I put our best man on it. Where are you going? Well, now, I'll bet you get some real good answers on that question. Where are you going, smart boy? Doreen Wilde's apartment. Yeah, why? To find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. It won't do you any good. Why? Coroner's report. The guy got knocked off about 7 o'clock tonight. Well, he took a long time dying. That towel was a joke. If he wasn't strangled, he would have been red-faced. He wasn't. Oh, well, now, let me guess, Hellman. He died of lingering malaria. Yeah, he was poisoned. That means he was dead when you brought him in. That changes things, doesn't it? A little. Don't let me keep you, Novak. I'm busy anyway. Yeah? Yeah. Checking your alibi for 7 o'clock. I had no alibi for 7 o'clock. That was right after the girl left my office. Oh, I might be able to dig up a witness, but I wasn't sure. It's like asking a horse if he's going to win the derby. Well, the questions were piling up, so I dropped by Doreen Wilde's apartment. I began to wonder. It was right next door to Condano's place. When she opened the door, I found out what the right kind of breakfast food will do. She was wearing a slack suit without much slack, and she was swaying slightly in a warm, slow way. Well, if there was any rhythm there, it's the kind you hear a thousand miles down the Amazon. And when she said hello, you knew it was all chemistry. Hello, Mr. Novak. I missed you at room 729. This will do just as well. Come in. Yeah. Hmm. You're wearing your face a different style. Yeah, Condano's boys didn't like it the old way. I like it. I like it very much. Yeah, what happened to you tonight? Frank was supposed to pick me up. He didn't come by. I see. Your brother finally showed up at the hotel. Oh, yes? Yeah. He paid off that IOU. Is that a quaint way of telling me he's dead? I suppose. Oh, don't sob so loud. You'll wake the neighbors. You know by this time that to me, Frank was a poor excuse at best. Nothing more. Besides, I knew he was dead. Father's down there now, identifying the body. Just for the record, who has those pictures now? Condano, I suppose. His boys piled me tonight looking for something. I got the idea it wasn't my social security number. Oh, you've had a busy evening. Yeah. They're going to book me for Frank's murder. Just call me Patsy. You need a drink then, darling. It can wait. Now, look, you're going to save some time if you tell me right now. No, I didn't kill Frank. Though I'd be willing to contribute to a shrine for the man who did. How about Condano? I don't know. In fact, I don't know Mr. Condano. Thirsty yet? Yeah, go ahead. Patsy, I'll give you $5,000 to find out who killed Frank. Hmm? Oh, I'll admit it was a good idea killing him, but I want to see the family name cleared up. Why don't you change names? That's easier. Oh, don't be crude. Will you do it? I may hang, and you can save your five grand. Here's your drink. The money might help. Should we call it a bargain? Suit yourself. Good. You don't want to stand there balancing that drink. No. That's it. Sit down. You know, you're an interesting guy, Patsy. I like you. Yeah? Yes, don't snowball the statement. Why'd you make it, then? It, it seems safe enough. You sure? You're a little close, Patsy. Are you sure? At this point, I don't care. Come here, baby. Patsy. What's on your mind? Where I can buy a desert island cheap. Looks like you got an offer. Oh, father, he'd forgotten his key. Excuse me. Come on over, Father. I want you to meet Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak? Yeah, they think I killed your son. Hi. He's the one I told you about. Oh, yes. Yes, now I remember. Oh, it's probably for me. Hello? Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think so. 
I'll be right there. I've got to run, darlings. Only be gone a while. Father, keep Mr. Novak sober, hmm? I'll pick up from there. Good night, Father. See you soon, Patsy. Hmm. A remarkable girl. She's active, too. Does she always sail out for a night camp? A remarkable girl. More so than Frank? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. You seem to like him better dead. Well, at least he's more harmless that way. But perhaps that sounds unbecoming of a father. Well, if he looks better that way, suit yourself. Well, I've never made any attempt to camouflage my feelings. I'm fond of my daughter. And my son, I've loathed. <laughs> In a casual way. He's a mishap of nature which for years I've been content to blame on his mother. This matter of the gambling debts, uh, case in point. You know about that? Oh, yes. Plus Doreen's liberal contribution to the problem. By the way, Mr. Novak, who did kill him? I thought maybe you did. No. <laughs> I'm not a doer. I just cheer from the grandstand. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Um, it's for you, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Patchy. I'm down at Condano. I know that. What'd you find out? Never play two and eight on a roulette wheel. All right, drop the clowning. Well, I found out about your friend. Yeah? They came in about ten o'clock, so that puts them right in line. No, not anymore. The guy got knocked off at seven o'clock. Oh, impatient, wasn't he? In that case, you better start looking for a tie-up between the girl and Condano. Not a chance. No? She doesn't even know Condano. She makes friends very quickly, then, because she just walked into his office. Well, things were beginning to fall into place. If the girl and Condano were that chummy, they were using those pictures. To squeeze the old man, probably. There was only one thing about it that didn't make sense. Why did Condano's boys beat my brains out if he had the pictures all along? Well, I talked to the old man a while, and then I headed for Condano's joint. They were closed when I got there, so I went home to bed. Oh, I'd have given a good price if Tamara never rolled around. But the sun was eating through the haze the next morning when I walked into Condano's place. A sad old biddy with a mop told me Condano was in his office, so I knocked on the door. Yeah? Hello, Condano. I'm the guy your boys pistol whipped. Novak, come on in. I wouldn't worry. Maybe you'll heal handsome. Thanks. I'm sorry about that, Novak. I'll bet you are. Well, that's the way you'll get it. It won't come engraved. If I say I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're full of tears. You gonna shed one when they send me up on a bum murder rap? No, I'll buy you a handkerchief, though. If you got the time, you might tell me what Doreen Wilde was doing in here last night. What do you care? Maybe we're in love. And maybe you're putting the screws on old man Wilde. Hello? Now, did you tell anybody you were coming here? No, just a birdie. It's for you. Yeah. Hello, Jocko. When? Well, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't make sense. Oh, of course not. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Well, how are you feeling, Kendano? Get to the point, Novak. They found a dead guy out in the marina this morning. He was shot and banged up badly, but they identified him. What's that to me? Nothing, except they identified him as Joe Kendano. Confused? No. It was a guy named Eddie Darrow. Friend of yours? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he was. What does that prove? It proves lots, Novak. It proves unless you find her in a cemetery, never trust a woman. Well, with a good assist from Deep Short, we could make it now. I knew that. Condano was mad about something and the lid was going to blow. I called Hellman. His lid was gone ten minutes ago. He had the murder gun and it belonged to old man Wilde. A messenger walked in and put it on the sergeant's desk a few hours ago with no explanation. Well, that was the clincher. From here on in, it was cakes and ale. I told Hellman what I knew. He picked me up at Geary and Taylor and we headed for the Wilde apartment. The girl and the old man were in the living room when we walked in. Everybody had breakfast? Patsy, I didn't know you came out till after dark. Well, we just wanted to call on your old man. Wilde, this is Inspector Hellman. Mm. 
Is there anything I can do? You're ambitious, Wild. Hellman's here to arrest you for murder. I'm amused, but not frightened. They might have gone easy on you for killing your son, but not Eddie Darrow. And who is Eddie Darrow? The guy you thought was Condano when you killed him last night. Your daughter was helping him put on that squeeze. She even sent in your gun this morning. Please, Doreen, tell these men. Well, the starting backfield. Hello, Condano. Step aside, Novak. You don't need that gun, Joe. Not for long. All right. Push the girl out there. Push the girl out there. For a gambler, these are bad odds, Joe. Just keep talking. Just keep talking loud. And when you stop, all of a sudden, you'll know I'm through it. You made the first switch, Joe. I didn't trust you, so I sent Eddie Darrow up. He was a good guy, and I liked him. I didn't kill him, Joe. You made it easy, though. Say him fast, baby. Here it comes. Look out, Tony. Watch the old man. Uh, Give me that gun. Yeah. We keep shooting the wrong people around here. Sorry, Hellman. I bungled, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you bungled, Joe. How's the old guy, Novak? He should live so long, Hellman. He's dead. You're gonna need me soon, Hellman. Yeah, right now. Come on, Joe. Tag by headquarters, Novak. Sure. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah. I'm sorry he jumped in front of me. He didn't have to do it. No, but you expected it. I suppose. I'm made to expect things, Patsy. Uh-huh. And you're not going to mind this. <laughs> I expected that, too. You can slap me, but don't leave me, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You got a cigarette? They're on the table. Match, Patsy. You go build your own fire. I'm leaving. Please, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You won't. I'll send you a whistle. Goodbye. Sweet double cross right from the start. Frank pitched the first curve. He stole the pictures from Condano's office the day of the payoff. He was going to wait for the dough from his sister and skip. In the meantime, the old man found out about it, killed the son, and left him in the hotel after Condano's boys had cleared out. Oh, it would have worked out all right, but Doreen found the pictures in the old man's room and guessed what happened. She gave him back to Condano and then made a deal with him to put a squeeze on the old man. Then she double-crossed Condano by tipping off the old man that Condano was on his way up. I guess he figured the girl for a fast play and sent a pal instead. The old man didn't know the difference. He really thought he killed Condano. And then the girl wrapped it up by sending his gun to headquarters. Well... Things had gone right, she'd have been right in the middle of that gravy boat. Her brother and Condano would be dead. Her father would be up on a murder rap. Once it started to unravel, it moved real fast. The first tip-off I got was when she offered the dough for her brother's killer. She'd have all that dough, and on the book she'd look like a field of Vermont snow. She was feeling around between somebody's shoulder blades and... From then on, all the cards fell just right. Condano was probably right. If they're not in the cemetery, watch out. Well, Hellman had only one question. Why would a guy want to kill off a dame like that? After I saw the pictures, I wondered myself. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you 
Pat Novak for hire. see why this is so popular with the armed forces. Um, I have to admit, what we just heard there with that slap, um, I don't think I've heard, I've heard before in radio. Um, slapping a, wo- um, a woman. Uh, I can't say a lady because she didn't, uh, I wouldn't say that she acted like one. Um, but uh, you kind of get a sense uh, that might, uh, of Pat Novak's uh, basic uh, moral code. It, it's not very complex, and there's not a whole lot in it, apparently, but uh, there are some lines that you just don't cross, and uh, I, I think that came out there. I, 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 li- I, I like the, uh, the uh, Jocko Madigan scene, where basically he uh, explained the writer's strategy for his existence. I'm your conscience. Uh, it was somewhat surreal in that sense, um, you ha- where you had a character sitting there explaining his role in the plot. Um, but uh, it, it was nice to see him somewhat contradicted. Uh, the lines here are just classic. I've met better people in the sewer. Um, I I, th- I thought were were very Chris. I, I did find that part where he got an apology uh, from the gangster for being pistol whipped, and he was like, "Hey, I said I was sorry. Can't you just you know move on?" Oh goodness, that's just like now nah, you you don't usually just get off with a pistol whip that. Uh, that easily, but uh, a very, very well constructed story here. I actually appreciated listening to this the second time around, uh, than, as opposed to last time when I'd li- when I'd listened to fifteen in a row, and this was just uh, number seven out of uh, uh, out of twenty. Um, so I'd heard the same thing. This one, I, because I've, I'd waited a little bit to listen to this one, uh, since I listened to uh, the sixth episode, I really, really, uh, you, you just hear the Christmas, cr- Chris, you hear the crispness of the writing, um, and the, the dialogue just fantastic, so... All right, well, that's it for this episode of The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Join us next Tuesday for another edition of Pat Novak for Hire. Um, Also, uh, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show at podcastalley.com. And join us tomorrow when we'll let George do it. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.